If you only focus on results, you're going to burn your people out. 65% of people leave bosses, not organizations. The sole focus on results burns people out, makes you less amenable as a boss, as a leader. If you're a people-centric leader, you focus on people first. You're going to get the results and you're going to get sustainable results. Lack of harmony is where people shoot each other's ideas down. We are such a divisive society. We're so ready to ridicule and cut another person down, even on an airplane, in a sports arena in a restaurant when we bring that into the workplace and that constant cutting people down that angst that anger that we bring into the workplace is causing drama conflict and disharmonized workplaces welcome to another episode of team anywhere where ceos leaders and experts at building teams companies organizations and amazing cultures share how to lead from anywhere in the world i'm your co-host on the east coast judy bianco mathis and i'm your co-host on the west coast mitch simon and we invite you to join us to team anywhere hello and welcome to another episode of team anywhere i'm your host on the West Coast. Today, we have an international guest. Today on the podcast, we have Stephen Howard, founder of Caliente Leadership, award-winning author of 22 books and keynote speaker. In his latest book, Human Leadership, Mindsets, Skills, and Behaviors for Being a Successful People-Centric Leader. It's a long title, Stephen. Stephen discusses how leaders need to unlearn management and relearn to be human. Steve Cadigan, LinkedIn's first chief HR officer said, human leadership is a refreshing and bold framework sure to help aspiring leaders today and tomorrow. So welcome Stephen to Team Anywhere. How are you today? I'm well. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you very much. Good to be with you and hope to add some for your audience today. Thank, thank you so much. All right. So We'd like to know, what's your background? What brought you to being so interested and passionate about human-centered leadership? Well, I was very fortunate. I, I grew up on the West Coast, and I was recruited by a company in Texas out of college. And after three years in Dallas, they sent me to Singapore. And then I'm working and living in Singapore for 21 years for four different multinational organizations before I started my own company. Uh, then I went to Australia for 12 years. And so, you know, 33 years, most of my adult life has been spent outside the United States. And I realized that globally, as human beings, we have more in common than differences. And that just led me to thinking about how we lead people across cultures, across borders. Um, so, yeah, that's what that's the background there. I've had, um, you know, three years of uh, many people being away from the office. The expectation would be that uh, we would learn a lot. We would go back. We'd be renewed. We'd be refreshed. We would focus on humans. Where is most of the focus in leadership today? Ourselves. We're more concerned about ourselves, our we're, fears. We are. <laughs> so we're focused on me, me, human, not you, human. Yes, that's right. There, there, there could be a me in leadership somewhere. <laughs> There's, Depending yeah, there is some language. <laughs> wow. There's only me in bad leadership. Wow. There, there is. I, I, in honesty, I mean, a lot of it has to do, there's so much uncertainty out there. I think that's really where the focus is. Leaders I talk to, whether they're entrepreneurs, senior leaders, or first line leaders, they're fair. They're fearful. They're scared. They, they, this is an unknown situation. You can't pick up a book before mine, hopefully, but you know, yes, of course, <laughs> hopefully, but the, you know, there's no manual for getting through what, what, what we went through and where we are today. Do you think then that is an interesting thought? Do you think then that um, because of what we've gone through and because of where we are, that anxiety levels or call it anxiety or fear is so high that it's, that's impacting leaders to focus more on themselves than they did before? More on themselves and more on results and the, a greater focus on results, uh, more pressure on results. And even, even some some so-called people leaders have kind of lost some of that inclination and there's just a lot of pressure to get results, uh, get things done, uh, achieve results. What's wrong with results? Nothing. But the thing is, is that if you only focus on results, you're going to burn your people out. And the, the, you know, the, we all know the 
you know, 65% of people, depending on what research you read, leave, leave bosses, not organizations. And it, the, the sole focus on results burns people out, uh, makes you less amenable as a, as a boss, as a leader, and makes you more of a manager than a leader. And so you lose people. So my concept is if you're a people-centric leader, you focus on people first, you're going to get the results and you're going to get sustainable results. Uh, one thing I was telling a... Uh, leader the other day is uh, he was frustrated because his first half results weren't anywhere near what he wanted them to be. And I said, what was your employee turnover like in the first half? I says, he said, unbelievable, 22%. I said, well, how are you going to grow your business when one of your priorities is replacing lost employees, placing them, onboarding them, getting them up to speed? And he goes, oh yeah. Oh Maybe yeah. Should... That's why I hired <laughs> oh, you. Yeah. Oh, paying yeah. you the... <laughs> That's why I'm paying you the medium sized bucks to help me out here. <laughs> So it's very, you know, it's very interesting is that we, you know, we quote unquote know this, you know, if you've gone to any management training, leadership training, read a book, heard a podcast, read an article, actually found a newspaper, we all know that if our people are happy, they're more likely to get you results. Yet people, uh, maybe, maybe because Steven, Steven, maybe it's because that there's more anxiety and more fear that people forget it so quickly. I think they do. I think also, Mitch, um, I think a lot of, uh, you know, admittedly, look, a lot of leaders are in their mid forties and early fifties, the more senior leaders and organizations. And if you go back to the 1990s or early two thousands, one of the, the key things about leaders, when you, everyone, when you say, if you're a strong leader, you get the most out of your employees. Well, I say, put the most into your people. And then you'll get the rewards, you'll reap the rewards from that. And so it's constantly that that 2000, early 2000, push, 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 quarterly, quarterly, quarterly. Uh, it worked then. It doesn't work now because of the pandemic. Things have changed. People have a different perspective of how important work is in their life. What, what is the priorities in their life? So if you're, a, if you're a strong leader, and we should know this, if you're a strong leader, you're going to put your effort into your people. You, typically you do. And, uh, and that's really what a leader is all about. Okay, so tell us um, what is the focus of your do you do you have your the title of your book memorized? Yeah. What is the what is the focus of your book? You have to tell us the name of that book again. Well, the book is Human E Leadership, so the title's simple. It's, it's okay. It's, all right, you're just gonna. Okay. There's the a subtitle. subtitle. Yeah, <laughs> the subtitle. It's it's three focus areas. It's mindsets, skills, behaviors, and okay. which will make you a successful people centric leader. So just it's right. the focus of the book is on three things, mindset, skills, and behaviors. Okay. And what was your inspiration for writing this particular, this one of your 22 books, human leadership? The inspiration, honesty was a sunset and a glass of wine. Um, but I was sitting on my balcony thinking about my life and the clients I was working with at the time. This is about, about 12, 14 months ago. And I, I was sort of grateful that I had achieved some harmony despite the pandemic going on. And I thought to myself, what we need is more harmony as people. And then somehow I, I wrote har the word harmony down. And then I wrote down on a piece of paper thing about the workplace and how we, we call people human assets. We call them resources. We call them um, uh, workers. And I thought, wait a second, we're leading humans. And so... I wrote human down and so, and then I started thinking about humanity. So I combined those three. The aspect was we need to change the way I, there were so many people I was talking to. They were so frustrated leading remote workers and starting to get workers back or thinking about getting workers back in the office place and the frustrations about that. And I realized that again, the way we led 10 years ago is not going to work. Long term, it might work short term, Mitch. Look, I'll be the first to say, you want to take all those ideas and the way you managed in 2015 today, it don't work for a year or two, but you're going to get in two years, 50% employee turnover. Is that, that's the cost of doing it the old way. Okay. So you're kind of giving us a smidgen of a hint as to what is human -y leadership. Um, you uh, talked about harmony. So can you kind of give us um, a broad brushstroke of what is human -y, what is what are the components of human -y leadership uh people first uh understanding that 
employees don't want to be managed. Uh, managing people is a 1980s concept. Um, people want to be led. They want to be empowered. They want to be challenged. And quite frankly, and a lot, a lot of leaders say, oh, the workforce today took the younger generation. They don't want to work hard. No, they don't want to work hard. They want to work smart and they want to be developed. They want to grow. So as you just said, part of that being a leader is how do you develop your people? How do you put into the people that you're leading? So it means a greater focus on mentoring and coaching, um, motivating, listening. You still have to be a manager at times. You still have to put that manager hat on and give some directives. Leaders give direction. Managers give directives. So that's, in a, in a small nutshell, that's kind of where human and leadership takes us. It's understanding the people. It's also understanding how people are interacting themselves on your team. Uh, one of the things I challenge managers to do now is to keep a diary for two to three weeks. And how much of your time is spent in meetings with your peers or your, your managers, your supervisors? And how much time are you spending with your team, not telling them what to do, but with your team listening to what their challenges are, what their hurdles are, what the obstacles are that they face, and more importantly, what are their ideas? And after three weeks, you know, the people I coach and the next coach, he says, says, I can't believe how much time I'm spending in, in meetings where we're just talking about what we're going to talk about in the next meeting. That is a great, a great exercise. So the exercise is um, to write down and capture all the times where you're just listening to your people. Yeah. If I give you a r real fast story, Mitch, it's just uh, encapsulate this. There's a lady out of coaching in Texas and um, very happy in her job. And this was the early days of the pandemic. And you, know, she was so excited because she had extra time on her hand because she wasn't commuting to work. And she started going to just other meetings in the organization, listening in on what was happening. And, and you know, she's 24 years old, learning. And her boss found out about that. And he, he said, every morning at eight o'clock, I want to meet with you and, and go through your schedule for the day. And I don't want you attending these meetings. And, he, and she says, well, why? And he says, I, I want to know you're available if I need you. So basically... Instead of going to meetings where she was learning about what else was being discussed in the organization uh, to be a future employee, she now had to sit around and wait in case her boss hit her, hit her on Teams and say, hey, I, I have a question. I, I need you right now. And so after six months, she actually, she left that organization. She's in another organization now. She's very happy in her new organization. And she doesn't have that micromanaged boss. He, he was afraid that, he, that she wouldn't be available. So that kind of summarizes so what we've been talking about now. Yeah. It's sad, you funny want... in a sad way. Well, no, yeah, it's funny. It's like, you know, if you really want to lose your people, micromanage them. Yes. It also is a great idea, especially with virtual and hybrid, is to um, you actually have the ability to pretty much go into any meeting, whether it's in France, Mexico, you know, Guadalajara. I mean, you're just, you're, which is part of Mexico. You could do it or, you know, California, Hawaii, Japan. And you could learn so much, you know, what a great, what a great, great idea. Yeah. And, and yeah. collaborate across functions. So, okay. So let's break it down, break it down, break it down, break it down. There are three parts to human -y leadership. And I want you to go through these three parts because I don't think most people think about, um, the way you've broken it down. So let's go through what are the three parts and can you start? Where I know start which one with whichever piece you think is uh, the place to start. Well, I guess human is the first part. Um, as I said, is we need to understand that we are leading human beings. I and I think one of the silver linings that's come out of the pandemic is the understanding that people have responsibilities outside the work. You know, before the pandemic, we would sort of, you know, say, oh, yeah, we understand work-life balance. You have a work, you have a life outside work. As long as you get your work done, that's okay. Have, have that life. But now we realize people have responsibilities. It could be caring for their elderly parents. It could be their children's responsibilities. They, maybe they're on some community organization or their religious organization or whatever. These are responsibilities to them. They're not, they're not life stuff. They're response. So if we allow them to fulfill those responsibilities, they don't come to work thinking about those responsibilities. They don't come to work frustrated that they can't achieve those personal responsibilities and they still get their work done. So that's, that's where this flexibility and adaptability, this is where the, you know, this is where the conflict lies today between those who want 100% work and work back at, back at work, back at the office 
compared to the employees who want, well, look, I want at least 40% work from home, or I want flex time, or I want the ability to, if I do come into the office, I want to leave at three o'clock because I have these other responsibilities. I'll get my other work done at five to seven o'clock. That's my responsibility. So I think the hum that's human. So understand the people, the people who work for us are not assets. They're not resources. They're not staff. They're not workers. The Probably the nicest things we call them as team members, but they're human beings. And that's a mindset change again. So that's where the human part of, of human uh, centered. Hey, we're taking a quick break to remind you to support our podcast by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a review. Your feedback means the world to us and it helps us continue to bring you more engaging and thought provoking content for leadership and remote work. Yeah, and so yeah, to capture that. So humans have responsibilities outside of work. I think that's the one quote unquote breakthrough, breakthrough of the pandemic was, oh, you have other responsibilities like all these kids that are walking into your uh, meetings and your um, parents or partner who God forbid gets sick or you've, yeah, you've got a, an organization where you're the, you know, the president of let's say the little league or something like that. And we need to, we need to, as as bosses and leaders and owners of companies appreciate that we want people to have those extra responsibilities. And why, why would we want to have, we, why would we want um, our team members not to be working, you know, 24 seven and just, you know, producing results? Well, cause if, if they work 24 seven or even, you know, 60 hours a week, 80 hours a week, they're going to burn them out. Um, but you know, this is, so this mindset change, Mitch is, People haven't grasped onto Amazon. Is I, I love Amazon. I have a great deal of respect for their thing. But when they let all those people go a couple months ago, what did the CEO and the head of HR focus on? We need to get our headcount in line. Our headcount. No, no, you don't. You don't employ headcount. You employ human beings. Now, if you had that as your mindset, you would. You may still have to lay off the same number of people, but the way you communicate it, the way you do it, would be significantly different. Uh, does, that, does that make sense? That yep, it does. Okay, so we've got human. So hu human e leadership. One of the parts is human, and what other? What are the other parts? The second part, humanity. And I, I admit, in the book, I don't focus on that. There's a lot of people who focus on things like ESG and you know what's good for the planet and the environment, stuff like that. But I do say in the book that where possible, or you know, leaders should at least pause and think about okay. The effect of this decision on my employees, that's the human part, the effect of this decision on humanity, you know, what are we doing to the earth? What are we doing to are the communities in which we work or, or live or manufacture in or sell in, you know, you know, what are we doing with regards to this decision? How's it impact our, our limited resources on, on planet earth? So, but I don't overemphasize that, but that's the humanity part of it. And then the last part is the harmony part, which is the, the fun part, so to speak, because when I talk to people and say, tell me what harmony is it at your work. They, they scoff at me. They laugh yeah. and they say, yeah. there's no such thing as harmony in the workplace. Well, what if there were? So again, just opening people's eyes, hopefully. What if there was harmony in your workplace? What difference would that make? When you're writing about harmony in the workplace, what is, I mean, it's not people singing. So what is harmony in the workplace? I think the, the best description I can give is, and we've all as individuals experienced this, uh, the concept of flow. You know, when you get into flow and you lose track of time, you're so focused on whatever it is, the task at hand. It could be, you could be personal. Maybe you're rebuilding an automobile in your garage and you, know, you completely forget to pick up your kids from the softball practice because you're in mm -hmm. flow. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing here, the whole department, the whole group, as big as it can be, but I kind of figure most harmony is going to happen at the team or department level. People are collaborating together. They're cooperating. They're, they're in flow. You've got psychological safety, which as you know, Google showed is one of the key aspects of how teams are productive and produce results. I think you get higher innovation, higher creativity, because people are, are willing to, the lack of harmony is where people shoot each other's ideas down. Harmony is, okay, Mitch, that I may not agree with that idea, but let me let me dwell on it for a while. Maybe I can build on it. Maybe I'll tell you 
and after a couple of days, no, I don't think that idea worked, but here's why. You'll listen to my idea as to why. We can discuss it uh, rather than me just saying, yes, you just see so often work. But, uh, we tried that five years ago. That'll never work. Or, well, the world has changed in five years. Or something along the lines, well, that's a stupid idea. Where, where'd you come with that idea? So the, all this, you know, we, we are such a divisive society where we were so ready to ridicule and cut another person down, even on an airplane, in a sports arena, in a restaurant, when we bring that into the workplace and that constant cutting people down, that angst, that anger that we bring into the workplace is causing drama, conflict, and the, and disharmonize workplaces. So to me, the opposite is just that well-oiled machine, that things are working. It's, it's, and look, it's kind of like world peace. It's never going to be there hundred percent. It's a great goal to aim for. And people, you know, people are going to have bad days. We as leaders are going to have bad days and we're going to bring, we're going to damage the harmony on some days, but we should realize that and then step back and figure out how do we rebuild harmony? How, um, I want to ask you two questions. The second question I want to ask you is how to measure harmony. But the first, the first question is, uh, Patrick Lencioni talks about mining for conflict is, is mining for conflict, having conflict, is that not harmonious? A conflict of ideas is harmonious. Interpersonal conflict is not. Um, and, um, but yeah, and, 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 and that conflict of ideas is actually productive conflict. Um, as I said, I, you have an idea and I have an idea and me, probably neither one is the right idea. But if we combine your idea and my idea, we get idea C. Maybe that's that's a little bit more innovative. So I, I think what Lencioni's on the right track when he's talking about the conflict around ideas, cog cognitive conflict, you might call it. And then, so I'm a leader and I want to create more harmony. What would I do? I'm going to go back to the measurement real fast. I think one way to measure harmony would be your employee attrition rates. I you know I, I consulted to a organization. I won't tell you which one, but an organization a couple of years or last year actually. Um, and the same department, an IT department in a big organization, two different leaders, both had staffs around 22 to 24 people, relative the same size. One leader was more of the people-centric leader, and the other was not. And the one who wasn't was running around 17% employee attrition, and the first leader had about 6% employee attrition. And in their industry, the industry average at that time was 15%, 16%. So you could see just within the same organization, the same function area in the same organization, two different styles of leadership. So come back to your question now of how can you bring harmony into the workplace? Mm -hmm. Look at yourself first. Look at what, what are you doing that causes disharmony? Uh, just make sure, you know, we all have biases. We all have unconscious biases. Where are yours showing up? Where are you playing favoritism, even though it might be subconscious? Uh, where are you showing favoritism towards one employee, towards the other? Uh, well, spend more time with your people and less time with your colleagues in meetings and uh, observe. I've got a guy I'm coaching right now, and what I have him do every day is spend 10 minutes just standing outside his office. And I ask him, I want you to stand outside. I want you to observe and absorb. Observe what you're seeing. Who seems anxious? Who Who's talking to each other? Who's not talking to each other? Just just. Over, and, you know, it's kind of one of these bullpen areas where he's got like 30 people outside his desk. And I said, but don't do it from inside your, stand out there and just kind of observe. Just sit there and, you know, drink coffee, maybe pretend you're having a conversation. Observe what is the uh, climate of your organization. You know, organizations have cultures. That's at the, you know, the cult, you know, Citibank has a culture. When I was a vice president of Citibank, Within my team, we had a we had a climate, and my climate was different than my colleague, who's the vice president of finance. He's a different type of leader. Within his team of forty or fifty people, they had one workplace climate. I had another, but we all were part of the City Corp culture. Uh, so there's a difference between the culture of an organization wide and the climate that we as leaders basically drive the climate and the way we treat people, the way we speak to people the way we listen to people, the way we interrupt people. That's how you start. You understand what you're doing first as the leader and then make those little baby steps to fix things that are causing the disharmony in your in the climate in your workplace. Yeah, no, I love, I love um, how it always, well, it doesn't always. It's to be a great leader always comes back to you. 
And so what I think you're sharing is look at your awareness in how you feel. Um, how are you being a human? Yes. Um, how are, you know, take, take a, a self check. How are you helping the future of the planet or not helping the future of the planet? Cause what we know is sustainable companies are sustainable, um, and they last forever. And then also <clears throat> ask yourself, do you have harmony within yourself? Or do you not have harmony within yourself? Because if you don't have harmony within yourself, it would be very difficult to create a team or a company or a culture that is harmonious itself. Absolutely. And Stephen, thank you so much for these insights. Um, how can people find you? And how can they pick up a copy of Humany Leadership, H-U-M-O-N-Y Leadership? Humany Leadership, it's in, it's on Amazon all over the world. Uh, it's in paperback, Kindle, and now in audiobook. It's my first audiobook uh, as oh, well, because so I know a lot of people enjoy audiobooks now. Uh, you can reach me, Stephen, at humanyleadership.com. I'm on LinkedIn. There's several Stephen Howards that look for the one that's in the green yes, of Los Angeles are. area. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I have, I have three first names. My middle name is also a first name. So, oh wow. But, uh, but so, uh, well, you're talking you're talking to Mitchell Simon right here. So. There you go. There you go. So yeah, LinkedIn's the easiest way to find me. I, you, you, but I'm on Twitter. I, I would highly recommend people also look me up on YouTube. It's Stephen Howard on Leadership is my YouTube channel. I got a lot of great content for people that's free there. So. Now go there, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you for, I, we're going to leave where you are, what country you are, a mystery to everybody, but thank you. <laughs> he's not in the United States. He looks like it, but he's not. So thank you so much, Stephen, for your time. I uh, really appreciate these insights on uh, becoming a more human uh, leader, a leader, uh, leader who is supporting humanity and a leader who is creating harmony. So if you've loved this episode, which we have, please share this episode with your friends, your colleagues, your family. And we'll see you next time on our next episode of Team Anywhere. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more engaging content from our podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share the video with your friends so they can join the conversation too.